Denver 7, KMGH. This is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is Ryan Fish with Denver 7, KMGH. How do you hear me? I've got you loud and clear. Welcome aboard the International Space Station. It is so good to speak with you, Major Ayers. What is it like up there inside the ISS? How would you describe it? Oh, man, you know, I, I don't think the English language has the right words to describe uh, what an amazing opportunity and what an amazing experience this is, you know. Um, I think that it, it never gets old. I like to do this trick, but, uh, you know, it never gets old to be able to, like, hang out on the wall or, you know, go into a module and talk to somebody who's on the ceiling um, or, you know, just let go of my mic and I can still talk to you. So um, there, there are just so many unique things about the space station, you know, that your your body has to adapt to and you have to get used to. But also we do a ton of amazing science up here and getting to live and work aboard the International Space Station and seeing all of the different international partners work uh, towards one common goal. And then uh, knowing that the science that we get to do up here, even though we have a very small part of a massive uh, research project, uh, we get to make a difference for the world and, uh, and help Earth advance uh, humankind. Well, tell us more about the mission that you're working on up there right now. How long are you staying up there aboard the ISS? And what have you been doing with the newest members aboard the ISS? Um, yeah, so our, our mission will be about five months, I think, by the time that we get home. We're scheduled to come home uh, this summer. So uh, five to six months is uh, six months is the, the average uh, ISS long duration mission at this point. So we launched in March, going home in August is the game plan. Um, and then, uh, you know, the, the biggest thing for us, the science, we do about 70, 60 to 70 percent science up here. And at, at any given point, there are over 200 science experiments going on, both on the inside and outside of station, uh, looking down at Earth, looking out at space. Um, so we have a lot of different things that we work on each day. Um, and then actually with Axiom 4 here, it's been a really cool change of pace. You know, we went from four crew members on the U.S. Uh, orbit, orbital segment to eight crew members. And it's been really awesome to see these uh, these private astronauts who are really they selected by their countries and are here for their countries and doing their own science and research um, and watching them adapt and just really just hit the ground running or floating, I should say, um, and doing some amazing science up here, uh, getting used to the floating part. You know, they only have a couple weeks, so they have to adapt quickly and they're they're just crushing it, doing a great job up here. It's really it's really fun to watch them. Uh, you know, it's fun to watch them and help them take pictures of the Earth and get to see the Earth from our, our point of view, you know, and, and help take that back to each of their countries. You know, we've got people from all over the world that are up here right now, currently six different countries represented on the International Space Station. So uh, it's been a blast. Um, and then, you know, Axiom is just an amazing example of uh, commercializing low Earth orbit. You know, NASA's goal is to eventually get to the point where uh, NASA can buy services from commercial companies that are cheaper than uh, what we pay for right now and then that allows us to focus on the Artemis program and getting onto the moon and Mars so a lot going on up here and really excited about the future of space exp exploration. Well what inspired you to become an astronaut to get to this point what was that catalyst for you? Oh man you know I I had an affinity for space and for the sky since I was like, you know, knee high, really little. I loved um, the, the sky and space. And, you know, I used to drag my family out, you know, out east of Colorado Springs uh, to get away from the city lights to watch meteor showers. And so I was always fascinated by it. Um, and then growing right up, growing up right there in Colorado, you know, I got to see the Thunderbirds fly over every year. So I kind of knew that the Air Force Academy existed and that there was a military potential path. And, you know, growing up in the shuttle era, as soon as I found out that you could fly the shuttle, I was like, that's what I want to do. So I, I and I was a very serious little kid. I set my goals really high and uh, wanted to become a pilot and then eventually an astronaut. And, you know, kind of put my nose to the grinder, worked really hard and uh, never got bumped off that path and was able to, to get here today. And you answered it a little bit there, but growing up in Colorado, how did that community, this community here, help you get to the ISS? Yeah, you know, I think there are so many opportunities in Colorado. Um, you know, I, I grew, grew up um, right there in Colorado Springs, went to uh, high school in Woodland Park, and so I had some amazing experiences in school. I had some great teachers that encouraged me when I said I was interested in math and science. And, um, you know, and I think I had some amazing coaches as well. So I think that being part of a team and learning how to 
to take care of other people was a huge part of uh, what got me here today. Um, but, you know, also just the exploratory side, you know, we're right there in the mountains. Uh, we lo- we grew up camping and hiking and stuff. And so the uh, the desire to go explore and see something that I haven't seen and figure out what's out in the world or universe uh, was fostered right there in Colorado. Oh, well, and talk about the training from that moment of inspiration and, and, and growing up and going to school. What has the training been like since then to get to this point, to get on this mission? How would you describe both, you know, how long it's been and what all you've gone through to get to this point in the training? Oh, man, you know, I, I tend to say I've only ever been in training my whole life. I, I feel like every time I get to a new spot or a new qualification, you know, there's something else that uh, that I need to learn. And so, you know, from the Air Force Academy, I went to grad school and then I went into pilot training. Um, and then throughout my career as a pilot, you know, I, I flew T-38s and then F-22s. And, you know, you're constantly working your way up in qualifications in the airplane and eventually got to the point where I was instructing uh, new, new people in the airplane um, and then got to to NASA and did two years of initial training, just um, astronaut training. So where we learn, you know, how to do spacewalks in the neutral buoyancy lab in the big pool there. We learn Russian language. We learn how to fly the NASA T-38s. Uh, we learn all about the space station systems and then the robotic arms. So there's a bunch of different facets of the training, the initial training. And then I immediately went into the specific mission training. So that was about another year and a half of training. And it's just more specific stuff for um, our mission and the science that we're doing, and then more details and more in-depth on the space station and how, how to maintain it and how to do all the science up here. So, uh, you know, I like to say my, my entire career has just been a, a bunch of learning and a bunch of training. And that learning and that, that work and science still continues. Uh, I know your day-to-day has a lot of that, but for, you know, for all of us down here, what is a typical day like up there? You know, I'd I'd say a typical day is actually not unlike what it is on Earth. Um, You know, we work from about 7.30 in the morning to 7.30 in the evening, and we have a schedule. The ground team, we have a flight control team on the ground and mission control that put a ton of work into uh, figuring out exactly how to schedule everything so that we're not in the same module or right next to each other, bumping into each other. And then we have, you know, uh, Marshall Space Flight Center, and they're in charge of all the science payloads. Um, And so they help... uh, with all of the different science procedures that we run. Um, so, you know, we in that 12 hours, we uh, do six to eight hours of work, uh, that, whether that be science or maintenance, you know, we have to be the plumbers and electricians up here as well. So we do a lot of maintenance on board. Um, and then <clears throat> we work out for about two and a half hours a day is what's scheduled. And so that's cardio and weightlifting um, or resistance training, because we don't technically have weight in microgravity. Um, But, you know, that's to keep our bones and our muscles healthy and prevent the atrophy that happens in microgravity. So, uh, you know, so it's it's fairly busy up here, but um, it's, you know, we get time for, we get a little bit of free time, we get time for meals and, you know, we get weekends. And so it's, it's not unlike uh, working at home. It's just you're, you can do things like, uh, like this. (laughs) Well, and to that end, uh, you know, eating and drinking and everyday things on earth, uh, you know, what was some of that adjustment like for you in terms of now living in microgravity, uh, things like that, or other other everyday things that you have had to adjust to in that environment? Yeah, you know, it's um, it's interesting. Like your your body really adapts quickly. It's amazing how quickly the body adapts. Your brain adapts. You know, you can you can drink just like normal uh, you just have to be careful because um drink drinks can fly all over the place you know I've, I've got a drink bag here so you know if you let go of things they might float away or uh if you forget to cap it uh you might have some some flyaway liquid but um you know it's it's pretty amazing uh and fascinating how quickly you get used to it um you know you get the fluid shift so uh without gravity you know a lot of the fluid shifts up in your body and up into the the brain area and so you know you kind of feel a little bit uh congested sometimes and maybe your taste buds get a little dulled because your sense of smell gets a little dulled but um but overall you know you kind of feel normal um minus the fact that you're floating like i said well, and you, you've done, you know, so much training for this uh, and, and preparing for being in that environment. Uh, but, you know, is there anything other than what you've said already that surprised you, uh, you uh, in terms of that adjustment, the work or, or the environment? Uh, and how does it compare to what you were training for and preparing for? Uh, 
Oh man, I, you know, I think our ground teams and our instructors on the ground do such an amazing job. You know, we have uh, a, a mock-up facility there at Johnson Space Center. And, you know, aside from uh, actually having things on the deck here, like a, there's a freezer right in front of me that, you know, it's the minus 80 degree uh, freezer that keeps our blood and other samples uh, frozen until it's time to come home. And aside from actually having things on the floor, um, the mock-up facility is pretty much the same. And so we get some really great training. Uh, so the the adjustment to um, the procedures and running all the science and stuff was actually pretty quick. Um, you know, it just, it takes a little while for your brain to accept the, the fact that you're floating. Um, but I think that one of the biggest things for me was looking out the window, um, you know, the getting to see the earth from this perspective i still am not used to that you know i'm still amazed by every sunrise and every sunset that i get to see you know this morning uh, the northern lights were out right over the northern us we flew right over you guys um actually i was taking pictures of denver this morning um well my morning your your midnight um but you know, and it was a beautiful, crisp, clear morning in Denver this morning. And then right after that, I got to see the Aurora come out um, and got to see the beautiful, you know, greens and purples even of the uh, of the Northern Lights. So um, I don't know that I'll ever get used to the view. And I, I try to take as many pictures as I possibly can so that we can share it with you all and then share it with the scientists because there's always data to be collected as we look back on the Earth. What is your message uh, first to the community here in Colorado who looks up to you, knows you or, or uh, is inspired by you, and then also just folks in general who want to do what you're doing and become an astronaut one day? What would be your message? I, I love this question. Um, you know, I think that uh, never stop dreaming, right? And um, be be excited and be aggressive with your dreams and set those goals. You know, like I said, I was a little serious little kid who set really high goals. Um, and you're always going to have someone who maybe laughs at it or jokes around about it, but um, you will always get to where you need to be. And the biggest the biggest piece of advice that I can give people is uh, work really hard. So that's what I did. Like I said, you know, find something you're really passionate about. Get really good at that thing. Work really hard at it and be a good team player, you know, take care of the people next to you and you'll get to anywhere you want to go in life. So work hard and be a good team player. That's what I love to preach. Well, Major Ayers, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. This is, this is truly a really special opportunity and thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, you know, to my hometown, uh, home state, I should say, uh, you know, I loved, like I said, the loved growing up in Colorado, loved exploring. Um, and, you know, really excited to represent Colorado up here on the International Space Station and represent the U.S. And, you know, we're doing some really exciting things in human space flight, and uh, I'm excited to share it with you. So thanks again. Station Disease and ACR, that concludes the event.